Great to be joined by our two guests. We've got Matt Landis, who does great work over at the Props and Ops podcast. Likewise, for Ben Brown over at Pro Football Focus. Gentlemen, it is great to have you aboard. And we were getting set to do this segment a little bit off air. And Matt, you brought up something that I'm sure so many people are going to be diving into, whether they are a professional better, whether they're a recreational better, or if they're somewhere in between. With regards to the Super Bowl, just taking a look at things, and early on in the week, perhaps being like, man, I really don't have a lot on my card. And then going to Sunday and being like, oh my goodness gracious, I have bet way too much on this game. I've got every single prop humanly possible. How do you try to manage just being able to have an appropriate amount of bets? Because I do think that that is going to vary from Super Bowl to Super Bowl. And I do think that it is very important to not get over-invested, but at the same time, where you do find an edge, be able to get down on that as well. Yeah, it's a delicate balance because with something like the Super Bowl, as much as props can be tough to get down on throughout much of the season, this is the time to really strike while the iron's hot. And at the same time, if you get overextended, then that could mean you could have the best betting day of your life. You could also possibly have one of the worst. So trying to thread the needle a bit there. And it's interesting, Greg, as you alluded to, as we were getting ready to do this segment, I was touching on the fact that I probably have about one third to to maybe even as low as one quarter of the betting volume right now that I typically do come Super Sunday each year. And that's probably going to pick up in a big way over the course of the rest of this week. But a big reason why I'm waiting on a few things is that the Super Bowl is that one betting occasion where public money can get lopsided to the extent that books, even if they're sharper books, even if they don't necessarily respect certain action, they can have so much exposure that you see certain odds on bets that you just won't see the rest of the year. And when we talk about public money, a lot of bettors like to bet, yes, something's going to happen. They like to bet on overs. They like plus money. They like to bet on human achievement, something that will maybe cause some chaos or lead to an exciting game. And I totally get it because the fan in me really aligns with a lot of those approaches. But usually value, come game day, the 24 hours leading up to kickoff, looking toward no's, looking toward unders. Uh, It might sound counterintuitive, but finding a lot of value where we see some heavy vig because it's not heavy enough. Betting against human achievement, oftentimes rooting for a boring game from a betting standpoint, it doesn't jive with what most fans root for, but that's often where we can find the most value on betting Super Bowl props. Yep, I think that that is such a good point that you bring up. Betting on something to not happen rather than betting on something to happen, I think is a way to be able to extract a little bit of value. And Ben, when it comes to just taking a look at the Super Bowl, how what is your general approach to this big game? Because as we know, there's a lot of props that are going to be available that you're not going to find on the average game. Now, the average game, it certainly has come a long way in recent years, being able to just take a look at a... Number two, number three wide receivers receiving yards prop is something that when I moved out here to in Las Vegas in 2017, wasn't necessarily something that I was able to do. I'm able to do that now in this day and age. But what is your overall approach with just such an expanded menu for this big game? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I do agree, uh, you know, both with what Matt suggested and you suggested, Greg, like waiting in some instances i know we're like beaten beaten to the point where it very much seems like you have to bet early and bet often in order to kind of get some of that value but kind of like what matt touched on like finding that value on some of the unders and some of the no's and everything else is very much probably going to happen much closer to kickoff because of how much public money has already kind of trickled in and already will continue to trickle in on the over of so many of these props and so many of these other offerings so i think waiting is is actually probably you know an underrated approach in this particular area but kind of to not i would say overextend yourself in any one way given all the offerings like you very much i would say kind of have to understand the correlation between different bets and different bet types and maybe trying to more directly target the narrative that you expect to play out or maybe you know target more precisely the 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 model output that you're kind of betting from a certain angle so one thing that i'm really you know interested in i do think like you know, the the uh, to give an example or a scenario like the Kenneth Gainwell usage scenario, right? Obviously, the Eagles have been up pretty heavily um, through both of their playoff games, and Kenneth Gainwell got a, got a lot more usage, especially from a rush attempt percentage than what I think a lot of people would have expected. But I do actually kind of buy into that because he has been their most dynamic back, and I think even with you know game script 
potentially not necessarily being something that they're going to be so positive in certain areas that actually might benefit Kenneth Gainwell even more to get more, 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 more opportunities. I would say in both the passing or the receiving game and the rushing game. But, you know, instead of hitting maybe some of his alt receiving yardage numbers or other things like you can kind of maybe, you know, from the Super Bowl specifically, you can play more of these head to head matchups where he, you know, is expected to have like more receiving yards or receptions than a guy like Jarek McKinnon and kind of playing that head to head matchup and maybe not targeting the plus price, but maybe targeting the relationship between two variables that you kind of like it is very much an opportunity that we get for the Super Bowl and don't really have. Uh, you know, too much opportunities to take advantage of outside the Super Bowl. So those are kind of the markets that, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, price out and understand and really bet early on in the week. And then some of the more traditional under receptions, under receiving yards numbers are, are very much going to be the things that I add as we get closer to kickoff, I would say. And, and as we kind of move to closer to, you know, those numbers, I would say getting more efficient toward the over. Yep, I like that approach, Ben, because I am sort of in the same boat. I'm not going to be one of those people that puts on, like, the national anthem. Yes, no on the kickoff. The coin toss, if I really want to bet on the coin toss, I will find a buddy that is on the opposite side of mine. We will take out the house juice and everything like that. That is a way to be able to be a little bit more efficient with that regard. But, Matt, when it comes to the way that you're going to be taking a look at a lot of these props, what are some of the ones that you're going to be taking a look at? Is it going to be a lot of player props over under? Is it going to be perhaps a little bit more in terms of just game flow in general? Yeah, I think a mix of player props and game props. And when it comes to the player prop side of things, to expand on one point that Ben made, if you look at matchups, let's take that example of Gainwell versus McKinnon in the passing game. Sometimes one of the benefits of having matchups in the Super Bowl, whereas all year long you usually just have a player's individual output, is that matchups can lag behind sharp action that we see to individual numbers. So I think of a Super Bowl involving the Chiefs a few years ago when they played the 49ers, Patrick Mahomes, Jimmy Garoppolo, rushing yards head to head. Mahomes was favored by something like 21 and a half yards. But meanwhile, leading up to the game, Mahomes gets bet up seven or eight yards. Jimmy G's number stays the same. And suddenly you're laying Patrick Mahomes minus 21 and a half yards relative to Jimmy G. And one guy is lined at 30 and a half and the other guy is lined in the mid single digits. So there are ways to just kind of let the market come to you. So there aren't any bets that I say, I have to bet this every year or I will never bet this because there's never any value on it. Trying not to think in absolutes like that. But Greg, I will throw out a specific bet in this Super Bowl that I have played that I wouldn't recommend waiting on for too long because I think it will continue to see some steam. And it's one that a lot of bettors might remember from last year. You mentioned not betting the kickoff. Actually, one of my favorite bets that I tend to find value on year over year is opening kickoff not to be a touchback. Now, last year, this backfired on a lot of people who probably played it for the first time when Pat McAfee really made it known. (laughs) But over the course of the regular season, if we look at stats saying that, oh, about two-thirds of the time when the Chiefs or Eagles kick off, it's a touchback, that can be a bit misleading because over the course of a season, there's a lot to be done for preservation and player safety. In the Super Bowl, field position is a subtle edge that coaches are really not going to leave meat on the bone when it comes to high, short kickoffs, forcing a return. Also, the return players, if you're deep for the opening kickoff in the Super Bowl, unless you have explicit instructions not to step back into the end zone and dig your heels in at the goal line, we see a lot of guys bringing kicks out from three or four yards deep that they normally wouldn't. So in both ways, I see some wiggle room that we don't get a touchback on the opening kickoff. And I looked in the playoffs. I mean, for example, do or die games with the Chiefs and Eagles in recent weeks, they are less than 50% kicking off for touchbacks. And that means that if this is about a coin flip bet, if there's significant plus money, I'll take the plus 140 I'm seeing right now. I expect that to come down. And if it moves so much that there's significant plus money on the yes for the opening kickoff to be a touchback by game day, I can't fault somebody for looking at it that way either. I just think this is the kind of bet that in Super Bowls is about a coin flip. And if you're getting substantial plus money on either side, that's probably worth putting in your pocket. And it's a fun way to ensure that, again, bankroll management, don't go beyond your means. But before the first snap of the game, I I think there's value here. And it's fun to know that you'll have a bet graded already. Yep, it is just so interesting because how many games do you have where you can already have multiple bets graded if you did what I probably don't recommend betting on the national anthem as well. You might already have two already in the bank account. 
before we've even seen a snap. And coming up next, we're going to be taking a look at this big game with Ben and Matt here on the Greg Peterson Experience on Visa and the Sports Bank Network. Great to be rejoined by these two gentlemen as we've got Matt Landis of the Props and Hops podcast and Ben Brown of Pro Football Focus. And Ben, we were just talking a little bit in the last segment about some things that there might be some historical data on in terms of the Super Bowl. And I just want to get your thoughts. When it comes to historical data in the Super Bowl, is it something that we can utilize for some of our bets? Or is it something that you toss out? Because I am more of the camp that it's like, man, you get two unique teams every single year. You've got a very finite amount of games, the games that are involved. You've got a lot of changing rules. And I personally cannot really utilize much of any of it. I'm not sure if you're able to find advantages with using historical Super Bowl data, but I do not. Yeah, I'm very much with you. I do think it is all noise. Like if you're if you're looking at essentially just like, you know, Super Bowl trends or Super Bowl splits, like kind of going back to it, you know, with what Matt talked about last week if, or last segment, like if you were looking at the percentage of, you know, first kickoffs in the Super Bowl that ended up being a touchback or not, like that is very much just noise or whatever. So if you're trying to, you know, uh, you, you know, price out some of these opportunities, you're very much, I would say, better off using either like league wide trends from the given year, given couple years and getting a much bigger data set or using some of the things for that particular team in that particular season. And I think those are really like the two, you know, main uh, approaches. Obviously you could go back a couple years with any specific team, but outside of that, like you're kind of just getting to the small enough sample size point where it does very much add up to only noise. And if there any is any sort of, um, you know, worthwhile trend in there. I think it's, you know, probably going to diminish or change uh, relatively quickly given the small sample size. So it's it's not something that I would say I'm doing whatsoever either. Yep, I agree with you there. And something that I think that we can both agree upon as well, because we've taken a look at a lot of strategy. We've taken a look at just some things that we're liking in terms of prop market. But what is going to be key in terms of being able to hit these props, in terms of just being able to make money on the Super Bowl is, Looking at the matchup itself, right now, we've got the Philadelphia Eagles in most spots as a one and a half point favorite. The South Point here out here in lovely Las Vegas, they are currently the lone book that I'm seeing at a two. And we've seen this total kick up. It opened up in some spots as high as a 51, and then it got down to more around 49 and a half. Now we're seeing a lot of 50 and a half to 51s on the board. And Matt, just in terms of more of the straight side slash total. Where do you stand on this game? Because I do find it a little bit interesting that this total continues to go up because I do think that with both of these quarterbacks are going to be good to go. And I think that they're going to be relatively close to 100%, but I don't know if either guy is going to be fully at 100%. And I think that that could cause for a little bit more stagnant offense. And I do like the under in this spot. Yeah, well, good thing for you that we've hit the key number of 51 pretty much across the board if you like the under, because now could be a pretty good time to strike that we've reached that threshold. I would say that I am fairly neutral at this stage, just thinking that in a market as big as the Super Bowl, this is probably going to be the most efficient point spread, the most efficient total when we're talking at a full game basis of the whole year. And I'll break down the matchup a little bit and then get to where I think the market's moving in case anybody's inclined to bet one team or the other and how to try and try to time that optimally. When we look at the Eagles, I think a recurring team from what we saw from them in the divisional round, it's not mutually exclusive for a team to be both dominant and fortunate on a given day. And I think in the NFC title game, I mean, they were dominant from the start. And one thing that was a big X factor heading into it was game management and Nick Sirianni and that Eagle staff seemed to be masterful in that regard. The Eagles' first two drives of the game, most teams probably would have walked away with three points, if that, and the Eagles walked away with 14. On the opening drive, they've got fourth and three at the Niners, 35. Most teams probably try a 53-yard field goal. The Eagles go for it. Catch or no catch by Devontae Smith. They get it ruled a catch. They score a touchdown. Second scoring drive, fourth and one on their own 34-yard line. Almost everybody's punting in that spot. The Eagles go for it. They convert. They go on to score a touchdown. Uh, things like that, I think, can really stack the deck in their favor. And at the same time, it's fair to say they were fortunate. The Purdy injury, three for three recovering fumbles, three for three on fourth down for Philadelphia versus 0 for two for San Francisco, four for six in the red zone for Philadelphia. Penalties favored them in a pretty, pretty lopsided fashion. So there's a lot to be said for being both good and lucky. And I, I do think the Eagles bring plenty of good to the table 
Kansas City, a lot of it's going to be, okay, how healthy is Mahomes? What are we going to get out of Juju Smith-Schuster, Kadarius Tony defensively? Do we get much out of Legereus Sneed and Willie Gay? So a lot of injury reports to watch closely. And to that end, I do anticipate that we'll probably get some positive news on the injury front for the Chiefs, just because with this being the Super Bowl, if it's humanly possible for somebody to be out there, they probably will be out there. And I think that that could move this spread in Kansas City's favor just a bit as we approach kickoff. So if somebody likes the Chiefs right now, I would suggest not waiting and, you know, take the plus one and a half or maybe a bit of plus money on the money line. Perhaps if you think Patrick Mahomes will be quite healthy, look at him in the range of plus 125-ish on the MVP market. And if you like the Eagles, no rush. I think you're going to get better odds as we get closer to kickoff. So while I'm neutral, I think there is a pretty clear plan of attack based on which team somebody might be leaning toward in the full game point spread or money line markets. And I do think that taking a look at this is so interesting as well because I talked about this at the top of the show on the current spread because right now we're seeing the Eagles as a point and a half favorite. If you like the Eagles, I would say just lay the point and a half because we've only seen one Super Bowl land on one and you just take a look in the NFL. Not a lot of games do land on one. You always run that risk, but as we know, if the game does land on one, there's essentially a 50-50 shot that the favorite is going to be the team that wins slash loses by one point as well. Meanwhile, if you're taking a look at the Chiefs, once again, same logic applies, being able to get plus money there. I do think that that lends for a relatively good opportunity as well. Ben, I'm not sure where you stand on that, but that's really my main approach to this because I'm still in a little bit of holdout mode. I'm sort of gearing a little bit more towards the Kansas City Chiefs in this spot because I do think that Patrick Mahomes, even if he is a little bit banged up, going to be able to will his team to victory. I want to make sure that there's no sort of calamity with regards to the injuries, that there are going to be some weapons available for him. But what do you think of the logic of just the fact that we've seen so many of these Super Bowls and just so many games in general in the NFL this year land on three, but very few land on one? Yeah, very much so. I do think like the 12 cents difference basically between, you know, minus one and minus 1.5, minus 110, and getting up to like the minus 122, you know, money line, uh, I, I would say, you know, probably isn't worth it at that point, but the value of minus one actually is in that scenario. So I would definitely lay the spread with the Philadelphia Eagles if you do like that side. I also am in agreement with Matt um, in, in saying that if we do move any more off of one and a half, it does seem like it's going to be in the Chiefs' direction. Um, you know, we did get a lot of the injury news for the wide receiver position for the Kansas City Chiefs today. They are going to have Legereus Sneed back. They are going to have Kadarius Tony. So the one question mark, and I do think if he wasn't, you know, expecting to play and potentially play to full strength is Juju Smith-Schuster. But it sounds like, it, 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 you know, very much getting numbers and things like that for him in the receiving yardage prop market. Like, he's going to play as well. So I, I do think the, the, the narrative that the Chiefs aren't going to have any pass catchers is probably a little bit overblown. But the question becomes, like, how can they win, especially in like the slot wide receiver position against the weak point of the Philadelphia Eagles secondary, which I do think is very much Avante Maddox. And if they do have the, the, the ability to, you know, bracket or double coverage Travis Kelsey, they're very much going to take advantage of it. And then it is going to need to be a guy like Juju or maybe a guy like Kadarius Tony that is actually winning in the slot. But I, I, I actually, you know, maybe lean in the, in the other direction. I do think Philadelphia um, could potentially win this one here. I, it, it seems like to me the the handicap is almost like the the Eagles could probably win this one by two touchdowns. But if it's a close game, you know, and, and, and you know at the end, like the Chiefs are probably going to emerge victorious. So that's kind of how I, I'm seeing it. But I also think we're going to get enough information from some of the initial play set from both teams to know kind of the direction I would say that the game's going to play out on the spread uh, for the remainder of the game. So I'm very much taking kind of that wait and see approach and probably trying to hop on some things in game, I would say, based on what we see, um, you know, in the first 15 or 20 plays, I would say. And I do think that that's a good approach to take because I feel like unlike so many other Super Bowls where typically, you know, who's going to be out there, who's not going to be this year's, it's got a little bit more injury information and you've got to figure that a lot of these guys are going to play, but It's not enough for these guys to play. You want them to be relatively close to 100% because just having a guy out there for a decoy, it provides a little bit of value, but it doesn't provide that full amount of value 
two gentlemen that have provided value all throughout the NFL season, though, is both of you. Ben, you do amazing work over there at Pro Football Focus. Likewise for you, Matt, over at Pro, uh, over at the Props and Ops Podcast. Appreciate both of you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, both of you guys pleasure. as well. Visit VEASAN.com to get current odds. Listen for free. Find showtimes and download VEASAN's Sports Betting Podcasts.